I'll call the hearing to order and welcome our witnesses, but before turning to our witnesses, we have opening statements and a few housekeeping matters. One is to ask unanimous consent that we include in the record for this hearing statements submitted by the AARP, the American Association for Retired Persons, and the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Is there objection? Hearing none is so ordered. In addition, Mr. Frank Wolf, Congressman Wolf is to participate today. He is a co-sponsor of the bill before us, along with Mr. Cooper. I don't think Mr. Wolf is here, but I'd like to ask unanimous consent at least to extend him the uh, courtesy of sitting on the panel with us. He would, of course, come last in order for questions. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. On the subject of the hearing this morning, there's really little dispute. Our nation faces grave fiscal problems in the foreseeable future. And the sooner we address them, the better. Today's hearing centers on Cooper Wolf, H.R. 3654, a bill calling for a commission along the lines of the Base Closing and Realignment Commission. Though I have concerns about this bill, I have great admiration for its sponsors, our budget colleague Jim Cooper and the veteran appropriator Frank Wolf. I believe that that bill is a genuine effort to address a serious problem, and I salute them, but I'm not sold on the vehicle they're offering. I acknowledge the precedent for a commission. The Greenspan Commission in 1983 was a huge success, but its recommendations did not bypass committees of longstanding jurisdiction and did not come to the floor in an up or down, leave, take it or leave it vote. In the years afterwards, the initiatives to resolve the deficits of the Reagan Bush years all took the form of select groups drawn from the leadership on both sides who hammered out agreements with the prevailing administration. That was true of Graham Rubin Hollings in 85, of the Bush Budget Summit in 90, of the Clinton Budget in 93, and of the Balanced Budget Agreement in 1997. Members of Congress working with the executive branch produced these agreements. As a result, these core groups who had been involved in the production of the agreement acquired some equity in the outcome and became advocates for passage through committee and onto the floor. I'm not all co at all convinced that this commission of 18 members, only four of whom are members of Congress, will have the traction needed to push unpopular reforms and entitlement cuts through Congress. And I have some real reservations about fast-track procedures that bypass ways and means in commerce and go straight to the floor, more or less unamendable, voted up or down. I think a lot of members will look upon this as an over-delegation of authority. The commitment and the consensus needed to tackle these problems starts with the President the leadership of the Congress, and there's no substitute for it. We saw that commitment in 1990, 1993, and 1997. In 1997, for example, every time the four budget principles met, every time we met, President Clinton had his first team on the field. It could be one day Frank Raines, the next day Erskine Bowles, but somebody was in the room every time we met who had the President's proxy, and that commitment was not lost on anybody who was participating. There has been no such commitment during the Bush years, certainly no effort to build or forge consensus. And unless there is commitment among all the stakeholders, the most likely outcome is that the Commission's report will meet the same forgotten fate as countless other reports from other commissions. The bill also has some oddities that we can cover with questions that uh, when the time comes. One is uh, it provides for dynamic scorekeeping, which violates Rule 1 of the Greenspan Commission. And that famous anecdote, Greenspan announced to his commission as they got started, everybody's entitled to his own opinion, nobody's entitled to more than one set of facts, and these are the facts. So I know that you'll find it, be shocked, shocked to hear it, but predict, projections, economic projections can be manipulated. And dynamic scorekeeping is one way of skewing a forecast in your favor, which is one reason mainstream economists are wary of it. Let me make a few other random observations and then turn to Mr. Mr. Ryan for his statement. This bill singles out entitlements that seem silent on other cost drivers as if entitlements were all of the problem. They're certainly a big part of the problem. There's one claim, for example, on the budget which is never called an entitlement, though it is obligatory. That's net interest on the national debt. Interest is too large to be eradicated, but we still have to mitigate or rein it in or else the efforts to reduce entitlement spending will be overcome by the swell in another obligatory account that for debt service. We will reduce Medicare or Medicaid only to have the reduction displaced by the increasing cost of debt service if we do not first balance the budget. 
My colleagues on the Democratic side are unlikely to put their middle income constituents through the ringer with cuts in Medicare and Medicaid only to have debt service keep rising and eclipsing our other priorities. One of the lessons learned in the 1990s is that the traffic will bear politically only so much. Social Security reform came in 1983, years before Medicare and Medicaid cuts of 1993 and 97. It's hard for me to believe that Congress in one fell swoop can cut all of the entitlements down to affordable size. It's also hard to believe that we can extend the 2001 and 2003 Bush tax cuts, repeal the estate tax, repeal the alternative minimum tax, and then add a few more tax cuts to the mix while we keep on increasing defense and funding other deficits, infrastructure, innovation, education. It's hard we can, to believe that we can do all of the above and still solve this equation. One preferred way that I think we would all support if it were entirely viable, one preferred way to make our entitlements more affordable is to make our people and our economy more productive. For that reason, I think that a budget reducing long-term liabilities should be discriminating when it comes to the support of education and job training and infrastructure and research and development and innovation, all of which can become long-term assets. Medicare and Medicaid are typically singled out in this bill as the chief culprits for fasting rising accounts in the budget. And over the long run, they are clearly the biggest part of the problem. But right now, the ri fastest rising spike in the budget post year 2000 is national security. Since 2000, national security has increased from 300 billion to between six and 700 billion this year. If we want to balance the budget, we have to curb our cut discretionary spending. And since defense constitutes well over half of discretionary spending, it too has to be subject to constraints. This is the, ele the elephant in the room, which we seldom discuss, but it's still part of the problem. To rid the budget of deficits in the 80s and 90s following the Reagan tax cuts and the defense buildup, it took almost 15 years and four deficit reduction plans. The good news is that we perfected the process. We sorted out what will work, multi-year budgets, pay-as-you-go entitlements, discretionary spending caps, and across-the-board automatic cuts. The bad news is today's deficits are probably more intractable due to the retirement of the baby boomers, war in two theaters, increasing debt service, and it may take even longer and several more iterations before we're rid of, rid of these deficits. To resolve this problem, it's quite simple. Everybody needs to be at the table, and everything needs to be on the table. And all stakeholders, for good faith purposes, should ante up, should have some skin in the game. That was true in the last time we did such an agreement. President Clinton led by offering $110 billion in Medicare cost reduction. Scored later at $90 billion, he raised it back to $100 billion. That was his earnest money. That was his ante. That was the way we propelled and carried forward these negotiations. And that precedent, I think, is a worthy one as we consider how to do it again. In the next few months, we'll have a new president. Whether it's President Obama or President McCain, let's hope he'll sit down with the congressional leadership and decide how we can move back to the path of deficit reduction and toward the sol solvency of our major entitlements. With a shared commitment, and that's critical, shared commitment, we can't do it either party by itself. We can move the ball again, I believe, as we did in the 1990s. The President, the, if the Congress and the President do not have that sense of shared commitment, that agreement to work together and consensus about what needs to be done, I doubt that a commission can supply it. We have today a distinguished panel of witnesses, Pete Peterson and David Walker from the Peterson Foundation, Bob Greenstein from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Henry Aaron from the Brookings Institution, and Allison Acosta Frazier from the Heritage Foundation. That pretty well covers the spectrum, and we look forward to a lively discussion. But before turning to you, let's go to the ranking member, Mr. Ryan. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chairman. I appreciate uh, your indulgence, and I appreciate the fact you're having this hearing today. I also want to welcome all this, the esteemed witnesses we had today. Uh, Dave Walker, it's great to have you here again with us. Uh, you're a very familiar face here with you, with us, and we're glad to see you here in your new capacity. Uh, just last week, Congressman Cooper and I uh, had the opportunity to participate in a bipartisan event right here in this room sponsored by the Brookings Institution with the sole purpose of discussing the entitlement challenge. It was 11 a.m., on Wednesday, we didn't have any coffee, we didn't have any donuts. It was just Mr. Cooper and me doing our respective PowerPoints on entitlement reform. 
And you know, we actually filled this hearing room. And I understand that Brookings even had to turn people away because we ran out of seats. <clears throat> I've probably given that presentation 50 times in the past month or so, mostly back home in Wisconsin. And the people keep coming because Americans know that there is a problem. They're beginning to understand the magnitude of the problem. And I can tell you from my own experience, they're ready to hear from their representatives about how we plan to solve the problem. Now, we just need to get Washington up to speed with the rest of the country. Now, Chairman Spratt, you're doing your part. He's called more than a dozen hearings dealing with the entitlement crisis and once again brings this issue before the committee. And my friend, Congressman Cooper, who requested this hearing today, and who, along with Congressman Frank Wolf, who I think is going to join us later today, has proposed this bipartisan commission to look at ways to address this challenge. All of these individuals ought to be committed for their efforts. It should also be a major component of the ca campaign debates this year, because if the candidates, and I'm talking about every candidate running for federal office, are going to talk about the issues of importance to the American people, entitlements had better be part of that discussion. But I also believe it's time Congress gets on to the business of doing what our constituents actually sent us here to do, and that's to move beyond simply talking about the problem and actually finding solutions to those problems. Because I believe that, I introduced my own proposal. It's called the Roadmap for America's Future. It addresses this challenge in a very comprehensive way and it achieves the following three objectives. It fulfills the mission of health and retirement security for all Americans. It removes the massive debt burden for the next generation. And it ensures American jobs and competitiveness in this 21st global economy. Now, I won't go through all the details. As you can see, it's a pretty thick bill. It's hundreds of pages long uh, with a 70-page report to go along with it. But to be clear, it's a real plan with real proposals, real numbers to back them up, and actually real legislation to implement it. I don't expect everyone to agree with every aspect of it. But I would ask you to take a look and leave your comments and input. You can go to our website at AmericanRoadmap.org because we need all to be a part of this discussion. Every expert Congress can find, from the GAO to CBO to the Fed to Heritage to Brookings, they've all come to the same conclusion. The entitlement crisis is real, it's serious, it's not going away, and it's getting dramatically worse with every year we fail to act. Congress has already demonstrated what does not work. Ignoring it doesn't work. Playing the demagogue doesn't work. Pointing fingers at each other doesn't work. We've done all of these here in Congress, both political parties. And every time we find ourselves another year deeper in the hole. Well, I have with me over here on my left shoulder my six-year-old daughter, Liza. Um, I bring a, each one of my three kids up here for a week with me during the summer break. By the time she's raising her kids and when she's my age, on the current trajectory, the government will be twice the size that it is today. Twice the tax take, the debt will be insurmountable, and we will for sure quantifiably be hand handing the next generation an inferior standard of living if we do nothing. So I ask everybody, look your six-year-old in the eyes, your daughter or your granddaughter, and ask yourselves here in Congress, is, is this what we should be doing? Or should we come together and fix this? We've got to recognize that these problems aren't Democrat problems. They're not Republican, Democratic problems, excuse me. They're not Republican problems, and neither are the solutions. We've got to build bipartisan support for action. And we've got to move beyond simply rehashing the problem to the politically difficult but critical task of debating, implementing actual solutions for the American people. Chairman, I thank you for having this uh, hearing, and I look forward to our witnesses' testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. And before going to our witnesses, let me recognize Mr. Cooper, the co-author of this bill. Thank you, Chairman Spratt. I appreciate your holding this hearing. It should be stated for the record that this hearing was an agreed compromise in return for blue dog votes for the budget. Uh, you were kind enough to allow us this hearing. Whether this bargain was worth it remains to be seen. I feel a little bit like that T-shirt we see sold on the street that says, my parents got the vacation. All I got was this T-shirt. Mr. Chairman, you correctly stated in your opening comments that we face grave fiscal problems. And yet, the status quo lobby here in Washington is so awesomely powerful, this Congress will do little or anything about those problems. This hearing is one of our few chances I wish it were a markup. A number of the comments that you have made, Mr. Chairman, and that we will hear in testimony 
do little more than create straw men and proceed to tear them down. Frank Wolf and I are very open on the membership of the Commission. It can be anything you want. We are completely open on the issues before the Commission. Taxes are on the table, and yet this bill has 40 or 50 Republican and Democratic co-sponsors. Tax expenditures are on the table, contrary to what you see in some of the testimony. Everything is on the table because we need to deal with these problems now. Mr. Chairman, you know that the presidential candidates are busy. They don't have time to focus on this. Members of Congress are not as busy, but we're still not focusing. I wish we could have a substantive hearing on Medicare reform, Medicaid reform, health care reform, Social Security reform, but where are those hearings? They're simply not happening. I think the best way to put this is, Mr. Chairman, history is watching and they are seeing this Congress do virtually nothing. And yet this could be the gravest issue of our time. I asked a senior administration official, I won't embarrass him publicly, he acknowledged there were terrible long-term problems. And I said, well, sir, when does the long term begin? He said, January 20th, 2009. Well, that's a completely irresponsible attitude. I hope that we don't go down in history as the Ostrich Congress, having sunk our heads under the dirt when we knew danger was approaching. I think the best way to show our love and commitment to our seniors, to all of our family members of whatever age, and to these vitally important American entitlement programs is to prepare to meet the need, not to duck. So, Mr. Chairman, that's what this hearing is really all about. I want to commend Pete Peterson, David Walker, because they've shown leadership on this issue for a long time. Books like this, their continued efforts, I just hope that we can rise to the challenge as the people's elected representatives to look beyond the horizon to prepare for what is, will otherwise be a very tough, dismal future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And now let's turn to our panel, beginning with the senior statesman on the panel, Mr. Peter Peterson. Mr. Peterson, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. We will make your statement part of the record so that you can summarize it as you see fit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here today talking to those of you who have the, long, have the opportunity to find sustainable long-term solutions to the problems facing the American economy. As you alluded to with my senior statesmanship, I've been around a long time, and it's been a long time since I've seen this many problems of a long-term nature that I call undeniable, unsustainable, and yet politically untouchable. Permit me to start with one number. $53 trillion in today's dollars is what the country owes, is projected <clears throat> between our future liabilities, our national debt, and our huge unfunded promises for programs like Social Security and Medicare. Social Security and Medicare are about $44 trillion of this. It is significant that Medicare is projected to be about $35 trillion, <coughs> and Social Security is something on the order of $7 trillion. So Medicare is by far the largest fiscal problem. Every American with this kind of debt is now burdened, most of them unknowingly, with more than $175,000 in federal liabilities and unfunded government promises taxes would have to more than double to pay for them. Slipping this huge check of debts and taxes to our children should indeed be not only unthinkable, but immoral. And our unprecedented current account deficits and levels of foreign debt, given our record low savings, level of savings is downright dangerous. Given our abysmal national and personal savings rate, we no longer owe this debt to ourselves. We owe much of it to foreigners. We simply must increase national and personal savings. We are leaving this country vulnerable to economic and geopolitical risks 
that no great country should be taking. And ballooning health care costs, our number one fiscal problem by far, threaten the very competitiveness of our economy. In our lifetime, as you know, 78 million boomers will retire, causing the cash deficits of Social Security and Medicare the foundation of America's social safety net. These deficits happened long before the so-called, and in my view, fictional trust funds are solvent. These programs must be reformed to reflect the demographic realities, <laughs> while also making them solvent, sustainable, secure, and more savings-oriented. The question, of course, is how to reform. reform. Some will suggest that we simply raise taxes. <laughs> Beyond the thought that it is unthinkable that we double taxes, I hear proposals that eliminating the Bush tax, ex, tax cuts, that is, going to fat cats like myself, will go a long way to solve this problem. Let's look at some melancholy realities. Let's suppose we got rid of all the Bush tax cuts, and I hear few proposing this. This would amount to something like 1% of the GDP. The projected increase in entitlement spending is 9% of the GDP. On the other hand, particularly given the rapidly growing inequality of incomes, I consider it inevitable that at the very least, taxes will be increased for the well-off. The point is, will they be combined with fundamental reform of these programs? Permit me to make one other rather obvious point. Spending these unthinkable amounts on mandatory entitlement programs means that other critical investments will be crowded out. I mean crucial investments in our children, their health and their education, and research and development. Indeed, as I look at the history, that crowding out process has already begun. I'm here because I'm committed to meaningful results in my lifetime. And as the Congressman indicated, this is an American issue, and I'm devoting a great deal of not just my energy and my time, but my financial resources to bring Americans together to find lasting long-term solutions. Sadly, we've gone from being an optimistic and hopeful society to one of great anxiety and increasing pessimism. For the first time in our history, a majority of Americans believe their children will not have a better standing of living than they do. That, my friends, is simply unaccepted, unacceptable. We owe it to the next generation to keep that dream alive and fully intact the way our parents did. Engaging Americans' youth is critical to this process. They are the ones, after all, who will inherit this sobering future. They are truly our greatest asset, which is why they must be a fundamental part of any conversation about America's future and the past, uh, and the path that we'll take to get there. Through the Peterson Foundation, we encourage Americans to make responsible choices today while providing opportunity for tomorrow. This lack of sustainability will eventually begin to, to cripple America and threaten the very foundation of not just our financial system, but our country. The time for action is now. The greatest generation <coughs> confronted challenges at least as daunting as this one's. They fought and paid for the costliest war in history in every sense of the word costly. Not only did they repay debts far higher than today's, but they bought into and paid for the GI Bill, the Marshall Plan, and the huge infrastructure highway program. We have done it before, and I can see no reason we cannot do it again. But, that change, but the changes required must begin somewhere. I see no better place than this room right now. So today, it's our mutual turn to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. And now we go to your colleague, um, the Honorable David Walker, formerly the head of the GAO, which is the last iteration we knew him, and now the uh, present CEO of the Peterson Foundation. Dave, welcome back. Thank you, Chairman Spratt. Ranking Member Ryan, members of the House Budget Committee, it's a pleasure to be back before you, this time as a private citizen uh, with my partner and boss, Pete Peterson. 
Today, the Peterson Foundation is issuing a publication entitled The State of the Union's Finances. This citizen guide provides a clear and compelling picture of the nation's true financial condition and longer-term fiscal outlook. Every member of Congress, every senator, every cabinet official, every presidential candidate, and yes, the President and Pri Vice President will receive a personal copy. It is also available on our website, which is www.pgpf.org. While the graphics and tables in this book look nice visually, they present an ugly picture fiscally. As the cover demonstrates, based on historical tax levels and absent meaningful in entitlement spending and tax reforms, the United States will face debt burdens in the future that would make the U.S. look like a third world nation from a public finance perspective. What do we need to do? First, as I have testified before, we need to provide more transparency in connection with our current accounting and budgeting processes. Increased transparency should involve some restructuring of the way the current budget is prepared and presented to the Congress and the President. From a financial reporting perspective, among other things, the government needs to recognize that the bonds and the so-called trust funds should be deemed to be liabilities. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. Either they are a commitment of the United States or they are not. If they are, they are a liability. And it should place more emphasis on fiscal sustainability and intergenerational equity. In addition, a summary annual report of the nation's finances should be issued each year, and a longer-range fiscal sustainability report should be issued by our government every four years, as in the case of most industrialized nations who are focused on the future. I have included in Exhibit 1 of my testimony a summary of the types of reforms that are needed. In addition to the above steps, we need to reimpose tough statutory budget controls on both the spending and the tax side of the ledger. After all, both sides of the books contribute to our nation's bleeding bottom line. In my view, the, the Congress also needs to consider adopting biennial budgeting and appropriations processes, and it needs to provide better recognition of the difference between capital expenditures and operating expenses while providing appropriate safeguards to prevent mischaracterization. Beyond the budget and appropriations processes, in my view, the regular order for addressing complex and controversial reform legislation especially entitlement reform legislation, but not solely that, is not adequate to deal with the number and magnitude of the reform efforts that we must address if we expect to return to a more prudent and sustainable path in a reasonably timely manner and before a real crisis hits. As a result, I support the need to establish a capable, credible, and bipartisan commission to address at least four issues, statutory budget controls, comprehensive Social Security reform, and round one of both comprehensive tax and health care reform. Everything must be on the table. The Securing America's Future Economy Commission Act, or SAFE Commission Act, H.R. 3654, whose primary co-sponsors are Congressman Cooper and Wolf, is intended to do just that. H.R. 3654 is not perfect, and there are areas that could be improved. But it now has over 90 co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle. One might argue that those who do not sponsor or co-sponsor proposals for changing the status quo are tacitly sponsoring the do-nothing plan. And the do-nothing plan will bankrupt America, and it will not create a better future for our country. In the final analysis, while reasonable people can and will differ, I believe that a commission will likely be necessary in order to achieve timely action in connection with several major reform efforts that lie ahead if we want to avoid a crisis. In my view, we need an action-forcing event. We must remember the Greenspan Commission was created at a time where the checks weren't going to go out on time within a matter of weeks. Believe me, that was an action-forcing event. We need another action-forcing event that is not a crisis. Uh, Given the greater public awareness that is needed here and the need, frankly, for Congress to have some cover to make tough choices that people may not otherwise like, in addition to publishing the State of the Union's finances, the Foundation has decided to purchase and support the distribution of a documentary entitled IOUSA. This film addresses four key deficits facing America, our budget, savings, balance of payment, slash trade, and leadership deficits. It will come out in theaters in selected cities in August before the presidential election. This will be one of many efforts that we will take in order to increase the visibility 
of this issue and hope that will be a priority for the next President of the United States. We also will have a private showing for members of Congress on Wednesday, July 9th in the evening at the Library of Congress. In closing, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. I do have a two-minute trailer that I would be happy to show, if you so desire, and the members do, of what the film is about. It is staunchly fact-based, nonpartisan, and non-ideological. That's the only way we're going to do anything in this foundation. Thank two to three you. minutes. Two minutes. Two, two minutes, minutes and six seconds. Well, let's roll it then. Thank you, sir. From the beginning. <laughs> you just lost about eighty percent of you all. Yeah, where, yeah, where's the sound? The State of the yeah. Union is not good. A trade deficit is too large. We must not go back to unwise spending. This is America. We don't do anything until something reaches a crisis. Prices are skyrocketing. This country has started consuming more than it produces. Let's say I don't have enough money to buy something. Should I buy it anyway? <laughs> this system discourages people from saving. I will be in a lot of debt. <laughs> Would you like to go on a date with me? No. Would you like to learn about the debt? Yes. God bless. We suffer from a fiscal cancer. Our current fiscal policy is unsustainable. We can't pay our bills now. We are headed over a cliff. If I perform like that as a physician, my patient would die. The vice president told me that we don't have to worry about deficits. I got fired for uh, having a difference of opinion borrowing the money and passing that bill on to our grandchildren. We'll be in such a deep pot to the rest of the world. We'll be dependent on other countries continuing to loan us vast amounts of money. We're now borrowing 22 cents of every dollar that we're spending, and you ain't seen nothing yet. We need to wake up. We've killed what made us a great nation. We must act today in order to preserve tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Walker, let's go on with Bob Greenspan of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. We've got, Bob, nine minutes and four seconds to go vote to adjourn. Uh, but if you'll take about five minutes, five to six minutes to summarize, uh, I think we've got enough time to spare there, and then we'll, we'll quit, leave quickly and come back. We've got two back-to-back -back votes. Bob Greenstein, thank you for coming. Thank you. That trailer is a hard act to follow. Yeah. Uh, I certainly agree, Mr. Chairman, with you, Mr. Ryan, Mr. Cooper, Pete Peterson, and Dave Walker, that if current policies aren't changed, the projected mismatch between revenues and expenditures will grow over time and eventually lead to a debt explosion. We need to start taking action soon to address it, something our center has been calling for for some time. As you know, we issued budget projections last year, 50-year projections, that essentially tell the same story. Uh, having said that, I don't believe a law establishing a commission uh, would be advisable. This is not a philosophical disagreement. It's a strategic judgment on how best to move forward based in significant part on my experience as a member of the last, as a commissioner on the last Deficit Reduction Commission, the Kerry Danforth Commission in 94. Unless the next president and the bipartisan leadership of the House and Senate are committed to considering both program reductions and revenue increases and system-wide health care reform, and to working out compromises on these matters, I think any commission will fail. A commission will only work as the Greenspan Commission did when the president and congressional leaders decide to work out a bipartisan compromise and use the commission members as their negotiators. 
And if the President and the Congressional leadership are willing to commit to negotiate a package, then they can go straight to the substantive negotiations themselves, as they did in 90 and 97, without convening a commission. Now, they may decide that a commission would provide the best forum for negotiating an agreement and educating the public, but that's a decision that can only be made if the President and the bipartisan congressional leadership have reached a consensus that serious negotiations are desirable. And if that's the case, a commission can be convened by executive order without legislative action, as was done with the Greenspan Commission. My, my bottom line is that I believe a commission will not force a consensus or a willingness to negotiate a bipartisan agreement where one is lacking on the part of the President and the congressional leaders, and that that's why the 94 Kerry Danforth Deficit Reduction Commission utterly failed. It couldn't even issue a, a majority report in favor of any specific policy proposals. That occurred because the President and the congressional leaders of both parties had no interest in having that commission come up with a bipartisan plan. The signal was clearly sent to the commissioners, and it all fell apart. By contrast, the Greenspan Commission had a clear mission set by the President and the bipartisan congressional leadership to restore solvency to the Social Security Trust Funds. It was a success because President Reagan, Speaker O'Neill, and other congressional leaders of both parties used it as a forum to negotiate a deal through proxies. The Greenspan Commission was basically a mechanism for President Reagan's top negotiator, Howard Baker, and the Democrats' top negotiator, Bob Ball, to hammer out a compromise on behalf of their principles. It was understood in advance and agreed to in advance that it would include both increases in the payroll tax and reduction in Social Security retirement benefits. And in this sense, it succeeded. Uh, history underscores, I think, the point that any successful major deficit reduction exercise starts with the president of either party and must involve the top leadership of Congress. And once the president, Speaker O'Neill, and other leaders agreed to move forward, the Greenspan Commission was established by executive order. Given that the stars were moving into alignment, no time was lost having arguments in committees and House and Senate floors over how many commissioners, what would be the shape of the table. It was formed by executive order and it moved. I'd also note that a BRAC type procedure was not used and a key provision of the 83 Social Security Act, the one that raised the normal retirement age for Social Security benefits from 65 to 67 was not proposed by the Commission, but rather was added on a bipartisan basis on the House floor in 1983. So it seems to me the real key here is how do we persuade the next President, whether it be President McCain or President Obama, to move after the election, to reach out to the leaders of both parties, and to be willing to engage in serious negotiations. If that occurs and the planets are aligned, a commission shouldn't be necessary. Uh, we had successful bipartisan deficit reduction negotiations without a commission in 82, 87, 89, 90, and 97. Mr. Greenstein, we're going to, have to stop right there if we can, and we'll come right back as quickly as we can to pick up where we're leaving off. Thank you very much. I think, I think it's time, can I? All right. Well, I want to hear what they've got to say. Are we going to keep going? Oh, we'll rewind. I understand. You want to go back? Come on, and take it over. The second version? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. going to be five minutes.